does he do? He might go all the way. He gives it a ride. It's a chance. It'll be a goal. This is the Swans Blogs Swans Cast, the number one listen to Sydney Swans fans podcast. Yeah, that's right. I mean, um, it was clearly an improvement on last week um, when we had the had the ball going forward to be able to use it a bit better, and um, and uh, and we did that. They had a real crack, the Giants too. So it was um, it was a pretty fierce game. So you know, to, to come out on the on the right side of the ledger, we're really obviously really pleased about. Hello and welcome. This is Justin Mitchell, your host, and on this week's episode, I am joined by Stephen Trelaw. Coming up in this episode, we will be reviewing the round three win against the Giants and the weekend of football that was. We will be previewing the round four game against the Western Bulldogs at Etihad on Saturday afternoon and everything else Swans related. Well, let's get straight into it. Stephen, how are you? Yeah, not bad, Justin. Uh, after that Giants game, uh, a little bit of uh, you know, apprehension. It was a good close game, but I'm glad we got the win. And after that terrible display last week, uh, it's good to you know yeah. be back on the winners list. Oh, it certainly is. Uh, that game was at times a little bit stressful, I would say. But yeah. uh, that third quarter, were you pleased with the way the boys actually turned around that third quarter effort as compared to, say, the Port Adelaide game? Well, yeah, and I'm just... You know, people talk about, you know, how a derby, there's always a bit of added pressure. I think that's true now um, with the Swans and Giants, especially given how close they are generally on the ladder each year. Um, In terms of, you know, general list strength, the Giants are one of the best in the comp, and I like to think that we're uh, up there as well. But, um, I mean, we did see that in... um, in the in this match, uh, with you know a few silly mistakes, a few um, shots at goal that didn't quite work, and there was that happened on both sides with uh, yep yep um, both Toronto and Reed. We'll get to that, but um, <laughs> no, it was it was uh, it was good for us to get the win in the end. And Buddy Franklin just at the end to shore things up for us. What a legend! Oh, what a way what a way to finish that off. Really sensing this danger that the Swans are in. Enter Buddy Franklin onto the scene. He delays the give. Franklin, this is Buddy Franklin! (laughs) This is the greatest showman! This is him! What a way to seal the win. Two goals. He was, I guess you could say that Phil Davis had his number close to goal, but the impact that he had around the ground was absolutely spectacular. Now... We kicked seven unanswered goals from about the seven or eight minute mark of the third quarter until about the eight or ten minute mark of the fourth quarter. And by then we were 33 points up. So at that point, were you uh, quite comfortable with the win? Yeah, I mean, I've given <laughs> given what I know <laughs> we're capable of with, with our best and our worst. I, was, I, I, hadn't, I wasn't hearing the fat lady singing just yet. Um, but no, it was, it was certainly... It gave me hope for the rest of the season that, you know, we can put that sort of effort up against the top teams. And, yep. you know, that's that's the stuff that wins flags. Yeah, it certainly was. And it was a fantastic team effort. And look, we're going to get into that a little bit later on in the show. But more importantly, some very big Swans news straight off the bat. Will Hayward has signed a one-year contract. He is going to be a Swan until at least 2020. That is fantastic news, Stephen. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, Will Hayward, I've, what he brings to our forward line, he can is one of those guys who, once he gets firmly established and once he builds up a bit, I mean, even though he's doing it now, he'll be one of those guys who will kick minimum two goals a match most, most games. And... Oh, he's just such a. He'll be such an asset for us, and you could say he already is now. Yeah, he had a fantastic game on the weekend. He popped up. He kicked a couple of important goals. He was playing more as a flanker midfielder at times, and I th- I thought that he had a really good impact. Just throughout the game, um, he wasn't 
kind of like his usual last year where he bob in and out, have little patches here and there and little kind of spurts. He was consistently in the game throughout the game. And do you think that there's even more to come from him? I think so. I mean, what, he's only, what, 19 or 20 or something. He's yep. got, in terms of his personal body growth and all that sort of thing, he's still got three or four years left of that. Um, another probably six years until he's at his you know, physical peak. And I, one thing that did impress me on the weekend, he took nine marks, which is really yeah. good. If he can float off the ground a bit, um, almost buddy style, almost. Like, you know, if he's, not getting to, if he's not getting into the game, which he's prone to do as a young player, um, for him to be able to float up, take a few marks, get a few inside 50s, uh, will be great for his confidence, I reckon, going forward. Yeah, it's a great way for him to get into the match as well. And it wasn't as if he had all of these disposals in the forward half of the ground. He had them, as you said, like all over the ground. He, the nine marks, he was taking them as far up the field as the back flank or at least the half back line. I thought his performance was uh, one of the best ones. It was certainly, I would say, his career best game. And the AFL-CA votes came in just tonight. Now, I'm going to run them down. We've got Callum Sinclair with eight votes. I'm guessing that Longmire's probably given him a five or a four. We've got Callum Mills on six. Will Hayward on four. Lewis Malikan on four. George Hewitt got three. So I'm kind of guessing that uh, Leon Cameron might have given him a two or a three there. And Lance Franklin just got the one vote. And from GWS, we had uh, Cornelio with three and Patton with uh, one or two. Yeah, it was Cornelio and Patton got two each for that one. That's right. Um, yeah. I'm I was really surprised with how lowly both the coaches ranked Buddy. I mean, yes, he didn't get his goals till the end of the game, but for the whole across both teams, he was second for meters gained, only behind Josh Kelly, who's you know regarded one of the, as one of the best young midfielders in the game, and yeah, the, the quality of Buddy's kicking. His field kicking inside 50, he oh, he's just brilliant. And Look, he still had a few shanks. Oh, but true, but he... He had 10 score involvements. Yeah, exactly. And he still managed to kick two goals and one absolutely absurd goal. So I thought overall maybe he's a bit stiff on the votes, but I thought his impact was still, you know, pretty much right up there. Mm. Now... Let's get on to our heroes and villains. So, Stephen, would you like to kick us off with your villain and hero? Okay, we'll start off with the hero, and I've given mine to uh, a former swan in Sam Murray. Um, Beautiful, I like it. Yeah, got a Rising Star nomination this week, and I've, it is a shame that he wasn't able to you know, slot into the defensive lineup. but what he's doing at Collingwood is really impressing me and you know all the people who were you know I mean when I heard that we were getting a future second round pick for him I was a bit confused I'm a bit certainly happy with it but uh (laughs) now I'm like now he's showing it at senior level that's uh looking like a bit of a shrewd deal on Collingwood's part he's still quite raw but Mm. he had flashes of brilliance last year in the NFL and you could see the way that he attacked the ball and attacked the play and he was so much faster than pretty much all the opposition that no one could get near him and he's doing that again in AFL level but he he has cleaned up his disposal so I think it's fantastic that he's come on leaps and bounds and we've done well we've got a second round pick out of him and I think Colling would have done well so everyone's a winner in this in this trade in this one yeah, definitely. Now, who would your villain of the week be? Now, this is a bit... It's not a villain as as though, you know, he's, uh, you know, absolute scum of the earth type evil villain. This is more of a... <laughs> you bloody moron, you nonghead, you comedic sort of villain. Timmy Taranto. <laughs> yes. Takes yes, a I, I can agree with this one. Takes a brilliant mark inside the goal square and decides to play on. Yep, yep. Just, as you do. It's ridiculous. And, you know, then suddenly Dane Rampey does a bit of a rock, which a kind of a lunge, which reminded me of that um, Heath, Heath Shaw, Shaw and Nick Rewalt. Yep, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Reminded me of that. And, you know, for our defence to save a goal, to save that goal was very well done, I thought. It was an important one, too, because they had the run on. Yeah, definitely. I guess... One of the most uh, amusing aspects of that was the commentary team were basically in stitches over it. 
And even Nick Rewalt was uh, having a bit of a joke about it when they said, oh, glad we did do that in a grand final. And Nick Rewalt's like, oh, I think that might have happened in a, to me in a grand final. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was, I thought it was absolutely hilarious. It was, it was a great rundown by Rampy. So, you know, all credit to him. Um, certainly uh, one of the moments of the game for the Swans, I thought. Mm, definitely. Now, now I'm going to kick off with my hero of the week. He is my sponsored player through the Redback membership, and his name is Callum Sinclair. Chief. Chief, the chief. He no longer has iron mitts or butterfingers. He is clunking them big time. And I guess probably the best thing that comes out of this is that when Papley was on the um, Sunday footy show yesterday morning, he commented on the fact that he has been working very hard on his marking and forward play. So... That's a that's a really good thing for him to be have done and improved. He was superb. He backed up his hitouts from last week. Um, he improved dramatically around the ground. Uh, he was able to impact contests, and he kicked three goals. So uh, all credit to him. Um, I know that I gave him best on ground. The uh, uh, coaches gave him best on ground. The only people who didn't give him best on ground was the people judging the Brett Kirk medal, who gave it to Callum Mills. So. What do you think of my hero there? Yeah, don't don't blame me at all for that one. Um, when you see he, when you see Cal Sinclair do that sort of thing, I mean, I'm sure he wasn't expecting to have that sort of role at the beginning of the season. He would have thought he'd be um, fighting for a spot, you know, with uh, Sammy Naismith and even Kurt Tippett. Yeah. Um, before he announced his retirement, so for him to you know really step up, and I mean, in um, I think you were telling me earlier in Dream Team, if you're a Dream Team or AFL fans, yes. uh, player is ranked second amongst all the Swans so far this season for uh, Dream Team points. He is. So he's doing everything well. Oh, he, he has had a superb start of the season. Mm. And I know that, because um, I do each week with the with the blog, I do the uh, five through to one votes. And I also do the player ratings. Now, the other thing that you might find quite surprising is the fact that he is rated as the third highest rated player in the player ratings so far this season as well. He's only, I think, about one and a half points behind Parker. Yeah, no, it's... From what I've, if you told me that, you know, at the end of last season, I would have been very shocked, but... Uh, <laughs> I think most people would have been... Yeah. They would have been happy for him to not be around, like, the bottom of the pack or just, like, middle range. He has been, I think, um, our most improved player of the season by a mile. Yeah, agreed there. I mean, we saw glimpses of it with that St Kilda game last year where he tore Jake Carlisle apart, but for him to be doing stuff in the ruck as well as up forward is, yeah, so good to see, especially with our diminished ruck stocks. Yeah, look, it, it's, it also makes the fact that you're right with the diminished ruck stocks. The losses aren't that, I guess, heartfelt because he has stepped up so, I guess, dramatically and he's improved out of sight pretty much in the space of a month of football. Now, for my villain of the week, uh, it's a bit of a hot topic at the moment and it's certainly doing the rounds on TV and radio. Now... I'd like to get your thoughts on this one, but it's the goal review system. I thought over the weekend it was beyond a joke. Mm. Did you hear that in the Richmond and Hawthorne game, they incorrectly gave Richmond a goal? Yeah, I've heard it. I haven't been able to see the footage yet myself, but look, I mean, with they try and they put this system in to stop howlers and to also give definitive answers, but at the end, there's still someone watching a computer screen who might need... Uh, some help from Specsavers. <laughs> yeah, you might need some help from himself. Specsavers. I mean, I don't quite... Re- yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> I mean, there was one... Um, I can't remember off the top of my head which game it was from, but you they had, were zoomed in on uh, the ball was dropping on the boot, and there was a defender's hand yeah, who touched it. West Coast. Yeah, the West Coast one, yeah. Yeah, they called it touch, but what happened was he touched... And you can see it on the replays, it's pretty clear that the yeah. defender touches it, but then after that, it touches the guy's boot and goes through for goal. Yeah, you can clearly see that kicking action where the boot contacts with the ball. Mm. But, yeah, there was the Swans reviews. A um, couple of them were line balls. Um, and then we also had uh, the new AFL um, 
Steve Hawking, can't remember his role, but he's come out and he said this is just not an acceptable situation. The um, Gold Review umpires are there to just help uh, with the mistakes. They're not there to interfere and to change scores. That they're not, They shouldn't be doing that. That's not their purview. Mm. They've got to stop doing it. They've got to get back to what their mandate is and to help stop mistakes, not interfere. Yeah, exactly. I can't agree with you more there. Look, uh, enough of that. Um, goal review system was a hot topic last season. Uh, it's probably going to be a hot topic again this season when Howl has happened again. But uh, look, it is the Swans cast after all. So let's actually talk a little bit about Swans football. Now, we had the Swans beat the Giants by 16 points on Saturday night. What did you uh, take out of the match in the end, Stephen? Uh, well, firstly, Buddy Franklin is... Underrated. I'm going to make that claim right now. Yes. Um, I reckon you, you could you can play him as a full time midfielder and be talked in five in like five circles. Uh, yep. The quality. I mean, he did have a few um, poor kicks as well. I mean, everyone does, but some of the quality of his field kicking the, uh, in his inside fifties, he just sends it like a bullet. It is ridiculous. Oh, yeah, it is. And he picked out, I think, Hayward on the chest for one of his goals with yeah. just a ridiculous inside 50. Yeah, that one sticks That one uh, sticks to mind really well. It was just an absolutely beautiful pass. And then, you know, doesn't, doesn't uh, get a goal till what was it, the 25th minute of the fourth quarter. But when he does, well, Dustin Martin, <laughs> eat your heart out. He's not, he doesn't have a copyright yeah. on the fend-off, but he can do it just as well. And just oh, bomb he that dropped from- him. Absolutely dropped Nick Haynes like a sack of spuds. I'm going to drop him like a bad habit. And <laughs> then goes and bombs it from Buddy 70. I mean, you just, you can't ask for if more that, than that. If that doesn't win goal of the round, I don't know even know what will win goal of the round. That was just beyond ridiculous. It's, and it's great because after that fend off, he's running towards goal. And you can see him quickly glance to the side, see if there's anyone there. But 99% of that time, he's just, he's just looking dead at goal. Yep. He's like, right, up the goals. time to get it. <laughs> <laughs> and just bang, and you just know it's on target. It's going to be a goal. You just jump up and start cheering because, you know, it's it's never going to be a point. No, but no. Uh, look, um, a bit of a surprise one in the end. Callum Mills won the Brett Kirk medal. I thought he had a pretty good game. I don't know if he was best on ground. I wouldn't say he was best on ground. And I thought that the AFLCA votes backed that up. Who did you think was best on ground for that? Yeah, look, I would have... I probably would have picked um, Sinclair or Buddy ahead of him, to be honest. I mean, I think he's. I think he said it best. He had a pretty good game, and he did get more touches than he normally does. But in terms of you know pressure acts and intercept possessions, he wasn't the best on ground in in very many stats at all. Um, no, he and wasn't. Of co- and of course, there is more to footy than stats, of course. But I think. Even in overall impacts, he just wasn't quite up there with the best. I mean, good on him for, you know, playing playing his role and doing it well, which he's been doing for a while now. But um, yeah, I do think uh, one or two maybe more deserving. I would agree with that certainly. And I thought his general play uh, in the second half, especially the last quarter, the way he stood up and helped get the Swans over the line, mm. was uh, right up there, if not critical, with actually helping the Swans win. There were some moments in that last quarter when the Swans' defence was really under attack. They were getting it in there with speed, pr- uh, precise passing, and he was still there defending and intercept marking and, do- and doing what he does best. I would agree with you. I would say Callum Sinclair was uh, my man of the match, and in the end, I gave him nine in the ratings, Despite the fact he only had, I think, 14 disposals, I still gave him a nine. And I gave him five for the uh, Swans Box Player of the Year. Mm. And um, obviously, as we've discussed, the coaches' votes came back with eight for Callum Sinclair. So I think I, I would be shocked if he didn't pick up the three Brownlow votes in the end. Um, he, he dominated the ruck and he really hit the scoreboard and impacted the game. I thought he was great. Now, did you have any uh, plays of the day from that match? Um, well, we mentioned it before, that uh, kick from Buddy Lace out onto Hayward's chest was excellent. Um, I thought uh, Tom Papley is not one who we haven't mentioned yet, who I thought had quite a good game. Um, yep, he showed his He showed a bit of uh, muscle and grit around the ball and uh, contributed a couple of goals himself, which was great. Um, but I think, and 
kind of to, as an extension of that, the fact that we had, you know, five multiple goal kickers and then plus Franklin makes that six, but yeah. the fact that our forward line could, you know, stand up while Buddy was up there in the midfield, that was it was a great thing to see. And I think the inclusion of Sam Reed really helps in that and Yeah, yeah, it does. Now he's um got a bit of a injury problem. Perhaps you could fill us in on that one, Justin. Yeah, look, um, the info that we have from the club is that essentially he just had uh, ice on his quad. Uh, the club doesn't know yet. I was hoping that they'd announce something today, but they haven't. So yeah. basically he's as good as probably not going to be fit and available for the Bulldogs clash. You'd never know. He might have just uh, had some tightness and they've put him on ice. He's got a bit of quad tendon damage, uh, so it's probably going to mean... An extended period on the sidelines. Um, when I say extended period, it's probably around the, I'm not quite sure, but around the eight-week mark at, the, at this time. So um, really disappointing news for, for him and us. Look, uh, I agree that Sam Reid really gave the team another option going forward, another another avenue that allowed Franklin, Haywood and Papley to play their more natural games. And the Swans forward line just worked beautifully because of it. Callum Sinclair chipped in for three goals. Rowan kicked two, and he looked really threatening in the forward half. Hey, we've got two. Papa got two. Um, and the team just gelled really well and looked really good going forward. Yeah, definitely. And also, it wasn't our midfielders. I mean, Kennedy and Parker got one, but the guys who got the goals were, you know, bona fide forwards. And yeah, exactly. I mean, ever looking back to forwards who can... Um, get a couple and get us the win. Now, another player I thought had one of his best games was Lewis Malikin. He was a bit of a rock in defence, and he did have a pretty good JLT series against the Giants. And I thought he did it really well, and he just backed up his JLT with another really solid performance. Do you think there is a uh, permanent position in the team for him? Look, I think there should be. Uh, in terms of who's going to replace Grundy when he goes, you'd think that Melican will be right up there. Um, to be honest, there aren't too many other players in the squad who can really do that role. I mean, you've got a Lear, but he's not really the, the one to you know sit, take the opposition's best forward and just sit on him. Uh, the, the only other one really is Jack Maybaum, who you know yep. who's, shows a lot of promise but is still young. Um, so yeah, I think while Melican is that you know heir apparent sort of role, I think and while he is you know, playing like he did on the weekend, I think there has to be a spot for him. Um, and I think being able to fit, if we were able to fit, you know, Grundy, Melican, uh, Rampy and Aaliyah all in the same back line, and, oh, it'd be so good if that worked. <laughs> yeah, look, you'd have the defensive rock of uh, Grundy and certainly what malikan has been able to do. And then you would have the aggressive intercepting and rebounding of Aaliyah, Mills, and Rampy. It would um, it'd be a seriously good defense. Now, another player that really caught the eye, and again, like you said before, stats do not tell the entire tale. He has His performance was lauded by the coach, uh, by other players, Callum Sinclair, and also Papley again on the Sunday footage show, and that was George Hewitt. Yeah. He completely shot Lockie Bufford out of the match. Now, how do you see his performance on Saturday night? Yeah, he's come across with a few good tagging performances, and I think we'll um, be discussing that a bit more when we preview the Bulldogs game. But, yeah, the way I think Winfield only had two kicks to, was it half-time or three-quarter time or something like that? It was just... Yeah, he had, I think, eight disposals or seven disposals up till three-quarter time and had literally no impact whatsoever on the game. Yeah, and you know, Winfield's kind of been setting up behind the ball a bit and almost off the half-back um, kind of distributor for the Giants lately. So for um so for Hewitt's shutting down like he did, uh, was really good. And I mean Hewitt's not um he's not, you know, a big accumulator, he's not a Tom Mitchell by any stretch of the imagination, but <laughs> for to have a There's someone, only one Tom Mitchell. Oh only one Tom Mitchell. <laughs> um but yeah, for him to be able to you know, add that string to his bow is uh, really valuable, I think, for us as a team. Absolutely, and it gives us a lot of flexibility in the forward line and in the midfield because you can play a number of different roles. Yeah. Now I know um, some people have sort of talked about Cunningham's game. Um, 
He did sort of hurt his leg when Callum Sinclair took that great pack mark in the third quarter. Uh, He wasn't well represented on the stat sheet. uh, And the thing that kind of concerned me a little bit was the fact that he didn't have any tackles. So typically he is a very good run with tackling player, but he didn't play any. So it, it said to me that his defensive pressure was well down on what it usually is. So when you're looking at players that could make way when... Uh, Jones is fit again when uh, Newman gets some form back. You're kind of looking at Florent and Cunningham as the two obvious choices, I think. I think Towers has done enough to keep his spot. Uh, He had another game where he didn't really have much of an impact throughout, but he played about six or seven different roles. Yeah, what 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 he's been doing for a while now, and I think people are kind of just starting to realise it, that, you know, what he does is so good for us structurally. That it, you know, it's worth um, having him in the team for that. He basically frees other players up to do what they do best, and he just does all the dirty roles. And he gets down, he gets in the pits, he gets in the trenches, and he doesn't complain. He just they say jump, and he just doesn't even ask how high. He just starts jumping. Mm. He's uh, he has been a great utility player for us. Now, as we talked about before, Sam Reed going off injured. Uh, I think that is a pretty big impact for us. I did read on one of the online forums, people um, were discussing Sam Reed's impact and one particular individual queried whether or not Sam Reed was the most important player in the team behind Franklin. Now, my response to that is I think Reed is structurally our most important player because it allows Franklin to do whatever the hell he wants to do, which is basically what he does best. It allows Sinclair to push forward or whoever's in ruck to push forward. Hayward and Papley to play further up the ground, uh, Rowan to attack the forward line from the flank and from the wings. Him in the team basically allows all the other players to do what they do best. Yeah, I agree. And whether that's, you know, taking pack marks or, you know, pinching in the ruck to give Sinclair a break all over the ground, um, all over the ground rucking, it's certainly a great um, thing to have in the team. And you can just look at what happened on the weekend. I mean, you know, six multiple goal kickers, uh, eight or nine for the team as a whole. It's, I think a lot of that can be attributed to having that extra tall forward, you know, half decent tall forward in there. Absolutely. I think that was the one ingredient that really missed in the Port Adelaide game. And the conditions weren't great. They were a bit slippery and both teams struggled. But I thought that we struggled primarily because we didn't have another option mm. in the forward line. And it was, it was Franklin or Bust. And in the end, it was just Bust because we couldn't even get it forward. Now, uh, a bit more happened on the weekend. So it wasn't just the uh, Swans game on the weekend. So we'll do our usual weekend wrap. So some general AFL news. Now, Gary Ablett in his third game for Geelong has gone off with a hamstring injury. So this is in the last quarter when Geelong were about uh, eight or nine points up and they looked like they were going to run out the game winners. He runs for the ball, pings his hammy, and then West Coast just go bang and kick six goals in about seven minutes. Mm-hmm. I think at that point, Geelong only had, what was it, maybe one or two on the interchange bench. So I think they just two ran... On the, yeah, that's it, yeah. Yeah, I think they ran out of ran out of legs, really. It was uh, Guthrie and uh, Nakaya Kukatu. Yeah, yeah, I think it was, yeah. Yeah, they were they were both injured. And the news coming out is um, Kukatu looks like he's going to be injured. He's going to be out for... Um, quite a while. Mm. I can't remember the injury, but it's something pretty severe. Yeah, it's um, it's a bit of X Factor gone for Geelong there. And, but can I ask, are you really surprised that uh, Gary Ablett has had a soft tissue injury? Yeah, it's, he's gone his whole career really without him. And he won't, he basically won't be playing against Sydney. So Geelong's injury woes are extensive at the moment. Um, they got rid of Motlop, which is now looking to be a pretty bad deal in the end. They've sold the farm to bring in Dangerfield and Ablett and Henderson. And at the moment, Henderson's out, Taylor's out, um, Dangerfield isn't in... He's in decent form, Selwood's in okay form. Uh, Ablett's obviously missing, Motlop's gone, Duncan's still out, he might come back at this week. Then you've got Cockatoo, Guthrie missing... Uh, it's not looking good. No, I know that. Um, I think, you know, that game against Hawthorne, the, you know, they had their holy trinity of 
Dangerfield, yep. Ablin, Selwood. I'm not going to mash their names together like everyone else seems to be doing. Uh, but they, Tom Mitchell just uh, demolished them, really. Yeah, single-handedly beat them, and he only had 40 disposals, and he was clear best on ground mm. in that match. Yeah. And I've said this on Twitter, and I, I think I might have said it about a dozen times already, but three players don't make a team. You can have the three best midfielders in yep. your team, and if they're surrounded by basically B and C grade talent, then they're not going to win many games. Now, people would have seen Ablett come in and would have gone, oh, he's in, you know, instantly top four, top two, premiership favourites. The problem was they lost quality to get him in and Taylor's, Taylor's out for half a season. So their best, arguably their best forward's gone or the best defender, best, whichever yeah. way you look at him. Either way, it's still not good. They don't have any rocks. Yeah, exactly. So their situation is yeah. worse than ours. <laughs> <laughs> they were yeah. they were playing Blitzars in the ruck who used to pinch hit as a third up and he can't ruck on his own because he can't jump high enough and mm. they're playing a 180 odd centimeter forward um, and they should if it wasn't for a shocking shot at goal they should really be th- zero three yeah it's um they've got a lot to work on there I think down in Geelong um, and. Whether we'll look back at the you know the magic midfield three and say was that a good deal was it not did, did they have the the best interests at heart of you know winning games of winning a flag well it's still up in the air I think at the moment yeah they've gone for the flag but I'm not I'm not sure it's going to be there for them mm. yeah I mean even that St Kilda game could be a danger one for them I mean without I mean without the the other players around might realise that, that, you know, oh, we have to actually, you know, get fingers out our butts play, and actually play yeah. well. But, uh, yeah, it will be interesting to see. Yeah, look, in St Kilda, they're, um, they're certainly smarting. They've um, been belted on and off the field certainly more than once. So, look, um, enough about Geelong. I don't want to really want to talk about them no. anymore. <laughs> but uh, another deplorable performance on the weekend. Uh, just the last thing about Geelong is they have played about eight disgraceful quarters of football out of 12. Mm. And the only reason why they won one game was because they played about one and a half quarters of good football against Melbourne. But anyway, that's enough about Geelong. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Essendon choked up big time. Um, uh, they were deplorable against the Dogs, mm. against arguably the worst form team in the league. They were dreadful, and they just made the Dogs look like their 2016 best. I don't, I don't think Bulldogs won it. I think Essendon lost it. Um, the I think if you look at the uncontested possession count, they just let the Bulldogs have the ball whenever they wanted, really. And, yeah, it was just uh, such a gulf between the two teams. Yeah, it really was. Yeah, I was actually um, working at Etihad Stadium that day. Um, I've, I do a bit of casual work there, and I was, you know, on the scanners at the front, so I couldn't at the front gate, so I couldn't see what was going on. But I could hear I was um, working actually just in front of the uh, Essendon cheer squad, so I could I could hear them, and yeah, it, they weren't too impressed at all. <laughs> no. No, I imagine they wouldn't have been. Mm. Now, I touched on St. Kilda briefly before. Uh, they were shocking against Adelaide. Um, dreadful doesn't even come into it. That That's not even in the vocabulary of how to describe how bad that performance was. Shocking. Uh, I'd say disgusting. Disgusting is a good way of putting it. Mm. They were just downright disgraceful. Yeah, they were. They brought in uh, Luke Johnson to try and, you know, shore up their contested side of the game and to be fair I think that did improve a little bit on last week but not much and gee there wasn't much else you could say that um, there was any good about St Kilda really there's just there's just no one who, I, is there anyone there who you could really say would get into a like a you know premiership winning club like no would you have would moment. you have Jack Stephen uh, in your premiership winning midfield mm-hmm. A couple of years ago. Couple, yeah, a couple of years ago, definitely, and you probably still would. Even but, midway through last season. Yeah, but, I mean, he'd be a... He'd probably be, what, your third or fourth midfielder? I mean, you don't you don't want him to, you know, take the ma- the massive midfield low, do you? 
No, not at the moment you don't. And there really isn't anyone from St Kilda, you know, stepping up to the plate and putting their arms up and going, you know, I'm going to take responsibility. I'm going to lead this team. Mm. And maybe that's because Nick Rewalt's not there anymore. And they're missing that leadership, that person who stands up and, you know, takes responsibility. But, uh, you know, they keep talking about it on football. I know it's ongoing commentary on Fox footy. Is the fact that after that, I think it was a round 16 win against Richmond where they gave him an absolute toweling. Mm. They've only won three games since and they've lost all their games by about an average margin of about 50 or 60 points. And it certainly started when we belted the crap out of them at the SCG. Yeah. Um, look, I mean, they've gone from a team who, you yeah, know, you would expect to be fighting pretty hard to make a top eight spot to a team who's now really in contention for bottom four. Wooden Spoon, yeah. Oh, they're- yeah, wooden spoon competitors. And the thing is, they did the worst thing imaginable. They made, by far, the worst team in the AFL look even better than them. And I'm talking about the Dogs, because the Dogs in round two were beyond dreadful. They they just looked like, it looked like West Coast had a training drill at the Etihad Stadium. That's how mm. bad they were. Yeah. Look, uh, enough of that. Um, the weekend of football has been, been good, but there's just a couple of um, unfortunate performances. Um, but uh, look, speaking of the dogs, we play them this Saturday afternoon. I think it's at 4.20 or 4.40. Yeah, it's a Saturday hour game, I believe, yeah. Yeah, and that's at Eddie Had Stadium. Now, as we touched on before, we've got some early injury news. Uh, Sam Reed, while well, he was seen icing up his quad, so we don't really know what's happening there but uh, at this point you'd say he's pretty much going to miss the game Um, Cunningham hurt his leg but he returned and played out the game um, so he should be fine and the other one is uh, Malikin um, who it's been said was seen with ice on his hamstrings on the bench now nothing's been said about that really anyway so you really don't know if that's a a legit thing or not Yeah, he's going to miss a, miss a couple of weeks, um, so he, he's out for a couple as well. He did his exactly the same time as Sam's. It was uh, probably within one second, and the same bit of play. Um, but, yeah, Sam Reid, in my opinion, would be a big out because with Sam Reid and the team, they don't have anyone to go with Franklin and Sam Reid. Well, not anyone good anyway. Yeah, no, I mean, it's given how... Um, our forwards performed against the Giants. I think the Dogs defence will have a big job ahead of them. Um, even yeah. even if Sam Reid doesn't play, uh, hopefully the confidence that the other guys will get um, will you know really uh, put us in good stead for the future. Yeah, look, we have had a pretty good record against the Western Bulldogs in general. It's just more. Um, in the more recent years when we've played against them when they've been really good between, I think, I guess, 2014 and 2016 Mm. when they were right up there. But, um, yeah, look, Reid out is a big out, but I still think we would win even if he wasn't in the team. Yeah, I mean, I I could go on a... I've got a view about the Bulldogs and I think I I could talk for a while about this, but I'll try and keep it relatively brief. I reckon since 2016, when they won their flag, their list has gone downhill big time. They won yeah. the flag on with a young list. The sky should have been the limit for them. And only 10, when they won a flag with you know a relatively young squad, and they've just gone downhill. And you know Mick Mulhouse has left, and now you know they are what they are now. But you look at the guys yeah. who, um, I mean, who have the who have the Bulldogs brought in in the past kind of you know year or two? They brought in. The one that sticks out for me is Josh Shackey. They've picked a, they've brought in a, admittedly a high draft pick, a decent forward, but he's he's young. You need to bring in guys who will really add to your list and make you make your best twenty two better. I don't think they've really done that at all. And when you look at you know your Port Adelaide who have brought in um, Watts, Motlop, and Rockliffe, that they're the yeah. guys that I reckon um, Bulldogs have really been going for. And the other thing to add to that is the fact that they've still got Tom Boyd languishing in the reserves. Yeah. Uh, so they 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 do have some decent quality players in the reserves, and it's it's a big chance that they're just going to throw Tom Boyd back in and say, "Look, your last one of your last games against the Swans was that good? Off you go," sort of thing. Mm. 
I don't think there'd be a repeat of it because um, for all intents and purposes, he's short on fitness and certainly short on form. Um, and, and it's a pretty expensive player to have basically playing 12 to 15 games in the reserves a year. Yeah, agreed. Look, our record, we apart from the last one, which we won at the SCG last year, we'd actually lost the last four against him, um, including those two narrow four-point wins. But before then, we'd won like six in a row against him. Mm. So... Our record since, uh, what, like 2010? If we go back to 2010, which is, uh, we played them three times. Um, it's pretty much like about seven to seven to six. Yeah. It's pretty balanced. Uh, they did have the wood on us for a while, but we're talking like 2007, 2008. So I, I would say that uh, going by where the teams are at at the moment, it'd be pretty much a bit of a shock if um, the Swans don't win this one. Yeah, agreed. Now, some of the changes I think we need to sort of look at is the fact that, um, well, Reed and Reed's pretty much, I'd say, about an 80% chance to miss. Malikins, maybe he could miss. It depends on if he's injured or not. Mm. Cunningham should be available. But Aaliyah was managed in the reserves uh, on the weekend. Newman was um, best on ground in the reserves. And Jones, depending on how he gets through the week, should be available. And now Newman and Jones, I think, would come straight back in for this match. I would be surprised if they didn't play this match. And if Reed's out, we need someone to come in for Reed. Yeah, agreed. If Newman's not named for the Bulldogs match, I really do think that um, you have some uh, incriminating uh, information or or something we don't know about because... He's got photos of the uh, coach's missus or something. Something like that, who knows? (laughs) Um, He's copied the Alia 2017 treatment. Yeah, or the Tom Mitchell a couple of years earlier. <laughs> yes. um, but yeah, I mean, he's he, he provides something really good for our team. And in terms of the possessions he gets, the when he, he can play forward and defence, um, I really think he'd be a good addition, uh, especially against a team low on confidence like the Bulldogs. Yeah, agreed. And... He does a lot of good things outside, um, or either on the back flank or on the wing. Uh, he's not very good as a forward, but what he does from behind the centre line is, I think, very good, very mm. important for us. And when McVeigh was out last year for extended periods of time, I thought he was superb um, kind of filling in that role. Uh, he certainly had a couple of near best on ground performances. Yeah. But I, I felt that he suffered a bit when McVeigh came back in and McVeigh returned to form and Jones was in the team and Jones returned. He was a bit, um, kind of a bit superfluous in that back line. They couldn't really fit him in there anymore. And then he wasn't really quick enough to play off the wing. So he was kind of like, he didn't really have a position. Yeah, agreed. I mean, I think he and um, Jake Lloyd being in, like him, Lloyd and McVeigh being the same team, I think, as you say, it's kind of too much of the of the similar thing, yeah. Yeah, he's definitely the long-term replacement for McVeigh. There's no question mm. about that. It's just how much can they get out of him this year. So now I've said that I think Aaliyah should come in uh, for this game. Even if um, Reed is fit, I would still like to see Aaliyah come in for this game. Up forward or in defence? Don't really care. I would just like to see him come in. Yeah. I, I think if he's fit... And he's and the coaches say he's fit enough to play. We should look to bring him back into the team. Yeah, and even if he plays um, limited minutes like he did in the reserves this week, I mean, he came out of it unscathed, which is great, even though he didn't play the fourth quarter. Um, and, you know, I think against the Bulldogs, we could probably afford to manage him a bit as well. Yes, agree, yeah. If Malikan uh, isn't fit as well, we've got Harry Marsh who can come in, uh, who's in good form in the reserves at the moment. Um, so I think we've got we've got the depth there to cover uh, anything that might come up at us this week. Yeah, agreed. There are certainly players that can come in and do the job when needed. Mm. So some of the matchups that we can look at is um, I've taken note of this one because I couldn't really find a player. Maybe you know of a player, but I've taken note of the entire Bulldogs backline against Franklin. Yeah, look, um, the Bulldogs backline. You look back at 2016, they had, you know, you think of the Bulldogs and their young team and all that sort of thing. But their, def- their defence was resting on two players. Um, Matty Boyd, not Tom Boyd, but yep. Matty Boyd, and Bob Murphy. And those two were veterans, so great great servants to their club. But, geez, now they're gone. And it looks like, you know, they've been rebuilding. 
which is a very strange thing to say about the you know the 2016 Bulldogs, but you know their um, their first round draft pick from last year, Norton, uh, he's played every game and he'll he'll play and he'll probably have to uh, take an important player this week, and I, I really think we should be able to overwhelm them. Yeah, I think um, Franklin's pretty much set for another day out, another picnic. Mm. I would be surprised if he doesn't finish with a bag of five or six. And uh, Hewitt and Johannesson uh, look like they're uh, going to renew their old rivalry when Hewitt gave Johannesson an absolute bath. I think that was a uh, was that last year? Was it? Yeah, yeah it was, it was last year up at the SCG. And all the other teams followed the same blueprint, and Johannesson just got smacked from post to pillar. Uh, it was quite entertaining in, in my mind. Yeah, that was brilliant. Now, I've got McRae versus Hanabry. Uh, do you agree on that matchup? Uh, probably, yeah. I mean, I think Hanabry, he'd be pretty disappointed with the output he's had uh, so far this year. He has had a bit of injury problems, um, and he did miss round one, I believe. Um, but, look, hopefully he can uh, you know ease himself into this season and really get back to the you know, massive contributing Brownlow vote winning uh, form he can uh, produce. But McRae, against McRae, he's been so good um, in terms of the amount of ball he can rack up. Um, so I, I reckon McRae might just have the edge there, but we'll see what happens, I think. I think it's a good opportunity for Hanabry to get back into a bit of um, form as well, especially if they go head to head and they just want him to run with or try and beat him. I, I think it's a good opportunity. Mm. But you might see you might see Kieran Jack go go to him or run against him. You might see Luke Parker as well try and do the job. Uh, another one, which I think is an important battle in the midfield, is uh, Bontopelli and Kennedy. So last time the Swans and Dogs played, um, it was, I think Heaney actually played a bit on Bontempelli and Kennedy as well. And Heaney laid some absolutely massive tackles on him. Mm. He got to holding the balls against him in about the space of a minute in the uh, second or third quarter last year. So it was, it was pretty brilliant. Look, Justin, a few people, oh, there might shock a few people that might not, but I reckon Bontempelli is an over, so overrated. So, yep. most overrated player in the game, I reckon. <laughs> he is, yes. some days he's just an absolute hack. Like, you, you say he's the prototype mid like you know the modern day midfielder is you know what is he 190 centimeters and 90 kilos whatever it doesn't matter if he plays like shit if he's the prototypical midfielder who can't kick mm. yeah okay yeah he is like the beast knees because let's face it he is literally the last guy you want taking a set shot for goal inside forward 50 i've seen him miss goals for 25 meters out directly in front and kick the worst frigate kicks you've ever seen in your life just mongrel drop punt and that goes to whether i mean that's the danger with these, you know, big body midfielders. Like, if they're not in good form in the midfield, do you move them up forward? And if they're not good up forward, what do you do with them then? I mean, well, Ad- Adam Goods was probably the first really big, big sized um, midfielder, mm. and he played ruck and then midfield and then forward. But he was he basically everywhere. as skillful yeah. as they get. Yeah, he played everywhere. Yeah, I thought he even played centre half back for. He did actually in his earlier in his career. I did read that he played centre half back for a few games as well. Yeah, I think he got um, all Australian in a defensive position. I think it was. I think he played that up, up until he played ruck, and I think it was Ede who had to chuck him in the ruck because they had no one else to play ruck. Mm. I think his what was it two thousand and two Brownlow. I think it was he. Was, um, Three, 2003. 2003, yeah. That he, was in the ruck. Yeah, he was playing as a ruckman. <laughs> and it was absolutely ridiculous that he was able to do that. Yeah, he was uh, he was a freak of a footballer, but he was certainly the blueprint of big-bodied midfielders and what they can do. Mm. And then you've got uh, Nat Fife, who's um, roughly about the same size, who can't kick to save himself. Um, Chris Jard, who was a little bit smaller, couldn't kick to save himself. Um Dangerfield, who's roughly about the same size as Jard, usually can't kick to save himself. Unless he kicks a bag of five against us in a final. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, then you've got Patrick Cripps. He's another one. Uh, he can actually kick the ball a bit. Um, I, I like him. I think he's probably, outside of Nat Fife, um, he's probably like the, the best roughly 190 
centimetre or so midfielder going around. Yeah, um, just don't, Kennedy don't trust is... him with a set shot at goal. No, no, no <laughs> I know that. But Kennedy, Kennedy's under 190 and um, Dangerfield's under 190, so mm. we'll say roughly 190 plus is pretty much, like I'd say, the top one at the moment. Yeah. But yeah, Bonton Pally, I agree. He's overrated. Mm. Um, you, you listen to commentary and, oh, the Bonts, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, ah, oh, give us a break. Yeah. I'm gonna, I feel like I'm going to throw up at the moment. Uh, yeah, I do. I, yeah, I do think it's the. Um, it's not necessarily Bonton. I don't think it's Bonton Pelly to blame. I think part of it's definitely due to the commentary and the, you know, the media. I mean, to be fair, he did have a brilliant 2016, but since then, and he's hasn't lived up to that form. So, you know, you, you Brian Taylor's and all that still uh, froth at the mouth whenever they hear his name. Banana, na na na. God. <laughs> Even that just made me throw up a little bit. <laughs> Orazio Fantasia. Orazio. Orazio Fantasia. God, this is quality audio we're producing here, mate. Orazio. <laughs> Orazio. Lloyd. Oh, we have fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, BT. Never, never stop, never stop what you're no, doing. Yeah, never gets old. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, uh, look, do you have any other matchups you think that uh, will, could sway the outcome of the match? Uh, well, I'm thinking about their forward line, but oh, who do they have again? Like, oh, <laughs> they've got Jack Redpath. That's about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't even know if Shaq is playing at the moment. No, I'm pretty sure he's. Oh, he might be injured, but um. A guy, a guy, <laughs> a guy who has been good for them is uh, McLean. He's um, a guy who go, you know, usually stays forward, but um, he's kind of taken Isn't over. Isn't he the one who constantly ducks? Ah, uh, yeah, probably is to be honest. But um, yeah, he's kind of always taken over Dowhouse's role in that he um, move, he goes up the ground a bit, and uh, he's certainly done well in that, but. I mean, given the players around him, it's it's hard not to do well, really. Look, another one that I mentioned um, I mentioned off air was Lockie Hunter. Mm. I think we need to definitely shut him down because he had a, a massive game against Essendon. So uh, it's important that we don't let him get off the chain. Yeah, I agree there. And um, well, season so far, it's only been three games, but I think that was when you let the Bulldogs run loose like Essendon did. Lockie Hunter's going to be the main beneficiary of that. He loves that, um, getting the ball with little pressure from the opposition, and he's deadly when it, come, when it comes to that. So I don't think I'll be absolutely fuming if we play the way uh, Essendon did, but I don't think we've ever played like that, not in you know 10 or 20 years. But um, yeah, yeah, only, yeah, only if um, we give... We give him that room. Will Hunter really be a dangerous threat? Look, they've also got their tails up at the moment too, so that's mm. always going to be a bit of a concern. Uh, thank you, Essendon, for doing that. Really appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Kind, kindly blow off. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, look, I, I still think we've got enough to beat them this weekend. Uh, our form line is certainly a lot better than the Western Bulldogs. And uh, one game doesn't make a season, mm. but they've played two absolute shockers so far. So I think it is probably going to be return to usual another shocker from uh, the dogs and hopefully we give them a spanking for them to remember mm. now it is time for good call and bad call from last week so on last week's episode i had rowan on he's a uh, i guess an infrequent um rider on the block now his three predictions I can't believe he actually predicted this. Uh, I was shocked and we actually had a bit of a laugh about this on the show. And he's just like, ah, oh, I'm just, you know, having a bit of fun. The first one was Eagles to win. Yep. yep. Tick. Good call. Tick. Good call. Ding. <laughs> good call. That was a, that was a call. good call. Yeah. Again. Now, this is, this is a fantastic call, this one. He had the Bulldogs to win. Big tick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, he didn't quite get the last one, which was Franklin four goals, ones by 10 points. I wasn't too far off, given Franklin's impact and the final margin. Yeah. Now, uh, <laughs> none of mine came through. <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> Franklin, oh, dear, four yeah. goals. Bam, bam. Uh, Parker, three votes. Three Brownlow votes. Bam, yeah, bam. I don't think so. He, he was nowhere near best on ground. No. Not even close. No. Uh, this is an embarrassing one. Carlton beat Collingwood. Bam, bam. <laughs> 
Yeah, <laughs> I, look, I'll tell you, I tipped, I tipped Carlton to win as well. Um, they were for a Friday night match. You know, big rival, big rivalry, big crowds. It was such an underwhelming game. It was just. Uh, it really was, it, wasn't it? Oh, it was terrible. Oh, it was a letdown. Uh, and there's been a lot of commentary uh, after that match, uh, pretty much immediately after that match, where um, I, I guess uh, Damo Purple, um, that weird looking guy with the glasses, <laughs> he's been very critical of Carlton having Friday night games. And I think a lot of people have been critical for a long time, mm. but they have them. Because they bring the crowd, and but look, that they can't, they can't kick one point for literally sixty-five minutes of football. That was just that was a deplorable effort. Yep. Uh, yeah. Look. Uh, now let's move on to our social aspect of the cast. So we put a question out to our listeners. Now our question was: Is a Buddy Franklin underrated? So we did get a couple of responses. So Megan from Facebook, she said that she said, I think he is judged really harshly and judged by the number of goals he kicks, which isn't the perfect way of judging his performance. I would agree. Stephen? Yeah, I definitely agree there. I'm, um, I, you know, trying to make a big point of it that his work up the ground is um, definitely above average, bordering close on elite. Oh, absolutely agree. And he's basically Sometimes. a midfielder for us more than a, a full forward. Yeah, well, if he played him as a midfielder, he'd be talked in the same level, in the same sentence as Fife. I think that would be quite similar players, to be honest. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the quality of his field kicks is absolutely brilliant. Neither key forward can do that. Um, yeah, I do think he needs to be judged on more than just his um, goal tallies, which, you know, is up there with the best in the comp. Absolutely, it is. Now, Christy from Facebook, she said, I think he's fantastic. However, we can lack depth or backup options because he's such a freak. You know, it's not his fault. No one's fault, really. Just that whenever teams work out how to manage him or is injured, there's a bit of uh, what now kind of aspect about it. And uh, I I think she's um, pretty much hit the nail on the head. And the Port Adelaide match in particular was a great example of that when... The uh, power just went. All right, let's play five on five on one, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. I, th- I agree with you there, and I think it's a different because we talked earlier about how you know Geelong players with um, Selwood, Ablett, and Dangerfield in there were you know could kind of rest on their laurels and let the stars do the job. I think the danger of the Swans forwards, uh, uh, you know, other than Buddy doing that as well, is certainly there. And I think to their credit, it hasn't happened very often, if at all. And if it, yep. you know, if Buddy has has been held, um, our other forwards can usually, you know, do all right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But we just need those options, really. Now, Luke from Facebook has also said, I don't think he gets enough credit for his upfield roles. If he doesn't kick any goals for the game, people get on his case. And Dermot Burton, I'm just pitching in here, but Dermot Burton um, is perfect example of this, where he's very critical if he doesn't kick goals. Uh, and Luke also says, but they don't realise the impact he has had over the whole field setting up goals. Perfect. Mm. And he's done it in most of the games he's played, and I think most commentators are finally coming around to the fact that you can't just measure him on goals, despite the fact he kicks 60 a season. I mean, on the weekend, he was second on the ground for metres gained. I mean... ten in, He had 10 scoring involvements and 9 inside 50s. Cast. I mean, I think that's another credit to Buddy as well. He's not just, you know, kicking, um, you know, 60, 70 goals a season. He's also contributing a lot to other to goals for other players. His uh, goal assist count yeah. is, um, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was quite up there. Um, the amount of goals he creates, yeah. Yeah, I think he should be the next Brownlow, full forward or centre half forward Brownlow winner after um, Tony Lockett. Mm. I would be disappointed if he doesn't win one by the end of his career Mm. now we've got some questions from our listeners so will from facebook has said is buddy more valuable one out in the 50 or up the ground delivering quality entries to another target steven if the one-on-one is against liam jones uh definitely keep him there Nah, Buddy's best when he's kicking goals, I reckon. Uh, yeah, the, that's that's a great one. Look, if he's up against Liam Jones-type players, um, keep him in the goal square. Otherwise, he's pretty much the best forward flanker in the league. Um, 
the one that really comes to mind is that pass that he gave to Papley off the halfback line last year against Adelaide mm. when we got that winner. So that's the sort of thing he can do. Now, Reese from Facebook has said, do you think that social media is partly responsible for the intense sportsmanship amongst fans? You know, often spiraling out of control. I guess he's referring more to uh, people getting on Twitter wars and Reddit wars and getting a bit carried away on fan forums. Yeah, look, I mean, that's I think that's just social media. I mean, you know, back in the days, I mean, I, in terms of, you know, the time I've been supporting, I've been watching footy and stuff. Social media's been there for a large chunk of it. Um, or I guess before, back in the day, you know, you'd go to the pub and have a couple of drinks and, you know, you might have a bit of argy-bargy with a opposition yep. fan or whatever. But in terms of all, all the verbal stuff that people keep spewing out, I mean, there's a page on Facebook, Nuffies, um, Nuffies of AFL or something like that. <laughs> they're brilliant. If you have, um, it's a yeah, great if one. you haven't uh, looked them up, give them a give them a like because they're brilliant. Um, oh, it's a piss of that one. The amount of crap that people come up with, it's terrible. <laughs> but at the same time, hilarious. Oh, it really I want to I want to get rid of it. <laughs> Look, uh, I, I've got nothing else to add to that. You've you've just nailed it, mm. mate. You nailed it. Now, Daniel from Facebook, uh, he's asked, who is the ideal replacement for Sam Reed if he's ruled out for this week? Now. I think we've touched on this. My thought is Aaliyah. I know some other people on Facebook, Twitter, and fan forums have suggested either Darcy Cameron or Amadi. What's your thoughts on it? I'm not a fan of Aaliyah up for just because I fear um, it could be a similar outcome to what's happening with Jacob Wiedering. Um, you know, draft is yep. a key defender being played up forward a bit and it could just ruin his confidence. Um, Darcy Cameron, I reckon should be worth a go at some point this year, uh, but I wouldn't be confident. I wouldn't be expecting too much from him. And Amadi, he was uh, in the reserves match against the Giants on the weekend, um, but I don't think he's... I think he'd be um, better off with another... just basically a whole year in the reserves. So yeah. Yeah, out, of all those, out of all those, maybe uh, Cameron, but I think what we've been doing is not ha- just not having that extra tall forward up there, have- maybe having Sinclair up there a bit more or um, doing that sort of thing. But um, yeah. I'd, probably re- I'd probably go with that rather than bringing in one of those guys up forward. Yeah, look, it's uh, it's going to be a hard one for the uh, coaches this week. Now, Dale from Facebook has asked, why do our forwards keep trying to pass when inside 50 like Heaney did on Saturday night? Or another one, which was Papley in the third quarter when he just, basically hacked it into the middle of nowhere. Yeah, I think it's um, one of the, you know, you take a mark inside 50, you try and pass off to a guy in a better position. Um, <coughs> Tim Taranto. Well, I've no idea what he was doing. Although Sam, Sam Reid was, um, was been lucky to escape my wrath because um, there was one moment where, you know, he was running onto a ball. Oh, he was playing on his own inside 50. And <laughs> I'm not sure whether he was trying to do a dribble <laughs> kick or just absolutely miskicked it, but... That was terrible. Um, that was a shame. Yeah. The pressure and perceived pressure of the Swans derby, I think, is um, getting up there with the best of them in terms of rivalries and just the... You know, and, I, I, you know, players' decision-making won't be, you know, at 100% all the time. And, you know, they are, they yeah. are going to make mistakes here and there. I think... One thing that uh, people kind of expect is the players to be a bit like robots, that their decision-making is going to be 100%, 100% of the time. Mm. That's never going to happen. So, yeah, look, players are going to make mistakes. I think they're still kind of a little bit rushed, um, but that's pretty normal early in the season. Yeah, it's It's to be expected. Yeah, it should improve. Yeah, it should. Definitely should. Definitely improved. Now, Darren from Facebook, uh, he's asked just how bad were the conditions at the SCG uh, over the last couple of weeks? There seem to be a lot of ball handling errors. Now, um, I don't know if you've been up to the SCG much, but uh, I've been up there a few times for those uh, evening matches, and it can be quite dewy and um, quite damp. Sometimes they leave the sprinklers on, but it was, for all reports, quite warm, but it does get quite damp there at night. Yeah, I mean, I've looked by watching the game um, on the weekend. It did look a bit um, slippery. The the you know, players' shoulders were looking a bit shiny and all that sort of thing. Even though I don't think it was raining too much in Sydney over the course of the week. Um, but yeah, I don't think conditions were ideal for you know clean ball handling on that on, during that match. Yeah, it was. Um, I don't think it really had that much of an impact in the end, anyway. Mm. 
Now we're on to our predictions. So, Stephen, could you please give me your three predictions for the round? Yeah, sure. So, um, alrighty. So, we'll start off with the um, Bulldogs Swans game. I reckon we'll give. I, I reckon the Swans will win, and I'll say conservatively. I reckon they'll win by at least six goals, and that's conservative. Yep. I reckon it should it should be much more than that if we really want to make that statement. And I yep. don't think, buddy. Uh, he's a more controversial one. I don't think Buddy will be leading goal kicker on the ground. Ooh, Buddy not leading goal kicker. Oh, I won't. I won't make this the only official one, but I reckon uh, possibly six. Oh no, no, uh, it's it's in. All right, okay, okay. No, that's in. Right, buddy I'm, I'm not, not leading goal yeah, no, kicker. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying who will be leading goal kicker, <laughs> but I don't think it will be Buddy. <laughs> now, do you mean on the ground, or do you mean he won't be leading at end around four? Uh no, I'm just. I'll keep it on the ground for this one. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So that gives us two. What's your third one? Third one, just looking at the games coming up, I reckon, okay, so uh, we've got a Saturday afternoon game, Richmond versus the Lions. Now, the way the Lions played against Port Adelaide on the weekend was great. They only just missed out on the win. And I reckon against uh, Richmond, it will be another... Cl- I'll, can I make a prediction? It will just be a close one. Yep. yep, I'll do that one then. <laughs> Richmond lines close. All right. Beautiful. No worries there. Now, for my first one, I am going uh, Franklin. Franklin has a picnic. Now, he could either bring out a picnic basket and just sit down at full forward and start eating his cold cuts. <laughs> but I'm, uh, I would say a picnic is uh, at least six plus goals. Yep. I, I don't think uh, the dogs have got anything at all to stop him. Um I reckon uh, Sinclair should have another 80-plus uh, AFL Dream Team uh, game. Yep. He should get a, or he should get, uh, do very well on the hit outs there, I reckon. Oh, sorry, that's the fantasy, AFL yeah, fantasy. Yeah. Yep. So he should really dominate this game. Uh, even if they bring in Boyd back or they try and play Red Path and Ruck, he should really smash yeah, this to pieces. Yeah, against Tim English, yeah, he should do well. And uh, look, I have got, for my third one, i got Port Adelaide. Uh, winning against Essendon at Etihad. Yeah, no, it's probably fair enough. Essendon was so bad against the Bulldogs. Yeah, and they'll be... Um, what will they be? They'll be 4-zip. Will they? Oi. Yeah, so they'll be clearly out in front. Mm. That's pretty much that, Stephen. Thank you for coming on. It's been a pleasure once again. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Always always love being on here and chatting swans and footy. Now, guys, as always, you can follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can get in touch with us using the tag, the swans vlog. And you can always get in touch with us during the week for extra comments and questions on the swans cast with the hashtag swans cast. Until next time, go swans. Go swans.